tonight, we're going to run a tight ship and start on time. <laughs> <laughs> Although I know some other people who are coming, uh, I was tempted to ask the short people. There's one of them. <laughs> to ask the short people to sit in front so the people in back can see the slides. But does it look okay to yes. everyone from where you are? You can see the slides. Well, our speaker tonight uh, really doesn't need an introduction, but I will make a brief one nonetheless. As you know, Admiral Poindexter served as National Security Advisor and Deputy National Security Advisor for President Ronald Reagan, remember, from 1983 to 1986, and his military assistant in the White House prior to that. He was also responsible for improving command and management systems to support the President and national security crisis management culminating in the creation of the new High Technology Crisis Management Center. We're also happy to have Mrs. Poindexter with us tonight. The latest. Now, not, no, not the latest, very much alive. <laughs> uh, Admiral Poindexter served for 29 years active duty in the U.S. Navy, uh, rising to the rank of Vice Admiral. While in the Navy, he specialized in training new tactics and battle management procedures and pioneering use of shipboard computers. That's how he's able to do the slide presentation. <laughs> Something beyond my competence. Uh, he holds uh, doctoral and master's degrees in physics from the California Institute of Technology. He's also a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Now, most recently, uh, Dr. Poindexter served as director of the Information Awareness Office at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, where he developed and demonstrated information technologies and systems to counter asymmetric threats by achieving total information awareness useful for preemption national security warning and national security decision making. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Poindexter. <laughs> now just wait one second while these people have a chance to get seated. There are a few seats over here. And Bob, thank you very much. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As, uh, as Bob so stated, uh, I'm not an expert on Islam. And uh, I am a retired naval officer and a scientist. Um, but Bob asked me several weeks ago to come and speak. And I asked him, uh, what do you want me to talk about? And they, he didn't have a, a, a exact specification, but I told him what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> and you all rank me. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you tonight uh, about is uh, national security and how it relates to the Islamic State, and what we can do about it from a foreign perspective and from the domestic perspective. And I want to compare it with uh, what we did in the, in the Reagan administration. Our strategy in those years was based on, on five pillars, uh, diplomatic, military, economic, public diplomacy, which by the way, Bob is very big on, and uh, covert operations. And it's, it's very important to understand that an integrated strategy is essential because each action, action in each of the areas provides leverage to actions in the other areas. <coughs> and I strongly believe that, that uh, we should be using this kind of strategy in the present situ situation with the Islamic State. 
Now, it is true that the administration is maybe doing pieces of this, but it hasn't been integrated in any meaningful way and explained not only to the domestic audience, but also to our foreign audience. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, we're in a, a state right now of great uncertainty. Uh, first, and many of you may be aware of the next few slides, but for those that aren't, I want to talk a little bit about geography and the geopolitical situation, uh, the geopolitical history. At the end of World War I, uh, British and French diplomats, the Sykes and Nicole, came up with a scheme for dividing the old Ottoman Empire. It was primarily based on, at the time, on British and French interests. It was arbitrary in terms of the tribal and ethnic culture of the Middle East, in other words, the Sunni and the Shia and the Kurds. In hindsight, it is my belief that that was a huge mistake, and we're suffering through the result of that right now. The area involved uh, is, is, at the present time anyway, is largely desert. Here is a Google Earth image of, of Syria and Iraq, and note that there are two major rivers that cut through this area, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. But all of this area here is essentially desert. Now, the current operational picture in Iraq uh, is represented here. And can everybody hear me if I turn to face the screen? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. <coughs> Note that uh, the yellow dots are the Kurds, the red dots are the Iraqi uh, forces, and the black dots are the Islamic State. Also note <coughs> that all of the activity occurs along, basically along the rivers. And of course the reason is that's where the people are. Now moving on, to Kurdistan, the, this is the, the northern part of Iraq, and again the, the scheme is the yellow are the, the Kurdish forces, the, the red are the Iraqi forces, and the black dots are the Islamic State. And of course Mosul here is a very large city <coughs> presently occupied by the Islamic State. Then in Syria, the Islamic State is this grayish area. The Kurds are up here to the north. Uh, in this area, this area over here, the rebels are in these green areas, and the government controls the, the red areas. Now one of the things to note here is that this is a border with Turkey that runs from, uh, I'm not sure how far it <coughs> goes, but this is the Turkish border here. And this area presently is occupied by the Islamic State. Now recently there have been reports that the Turks and the Kurds are working to close off uh, this border area which would be uh, very helpful for the prosecution of the war. Now, the Islamic State control is expanding. Uh, it's shown here uh, in December of 2014, and recall they, they announced the Islamic State in June of 2014. So the, the yellowish color here represents where the Islamic state forces were at, in December, and this red represents the expansion that had occurred by May of last year. Now, this slide is not exactly up to date, because recently, as you've heard, there, there have been some advances of the Iraqi forces into uh, Ramadi, 
uh, in, in this area here. Okay. Um, all right. Now, this is the published Islamic State five-year plan. Now, uh, recall, as I mentioned, the Islamic State was formed in June of 2014, and their stated goal is that the Islamic State will expand within five years to its natural caliphal borders. In other words, this the black areas. This is the original Arab and the English transliteration here. Now, granted, one of my colleagues says, you know, that this is ridiculous. They'll never do that. Um, and and granted, you know, it is uh, a little over the top in terms of what they. Uh, say they plan to do in five years. However, it becomes this kind of published plan within the Islamic State forces becomes a great aid in recruiting people to come from foreign countries into the area to, to participate in the battle. Just recently, there was a report of a, uh, a radio calling themselves the voice of the caliphate, is broadcasting in Afghanistan and talking about how uh, Khorasan, how do you pronounce that, Khorasan? Khorasan. Khorasan. Uh, so it's, it's not out of the question, and it's certainly something that we should take seriously, that, you know, this is their stated objective. We should take that seriously and anticipate having to resist uh, that movement. <clears throat> Here is a, uh, from an article in the Wall Street Journal on the uh, of January of this year, and it shows how the terror battlefield has spread. And the black dots here are major events terrorist activity, of course San Bernardino here, uh, the uh, destruction of the Soviet, the Russian aircraft here. But the thing I want to point out is this bottom line showing how the, 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 the number of fatalities, which are represented by the size of the circles, the number of fatalities and the frequency of events has been increasing over the past few months. Mm -hmm. Now, President Obama has said that this is not, the Islamic State is not an existential threat to the United States. But I would argue that it all depends on your definition of existential. Certainly to the people that are murdered, it is an existential threat. And we can't ignore it and can't imply that we're willing to accept other San Bernardinos. <clears throat> so, in my opinion, we're at war. And we ought to recognize that. The war is not against Islam, but it's against the Islamic State that holds an old interpretation of Islam. And I think this is generally accepted definition these days, but Islamism <clears throat> is carried out by these Islamists. This interpretation of Islam, as Bob has very uh, uh, described in great detail based on his very significant research, this interpretation of the Quran that the Islamists are using was radical when it first was proposed centuries ago, and it's certainly radical in terms of the modern world. But it is supported in some of the Quranic passages, and that's one of the problems. And in my opinion, it is an existential threat to the free world way of life. You know, they may not be able to destroy the United States physically, but they can certainly have an impact on the way of life in the United States and the free world. 
And so I consider that an existential threat. The solution, since we are at war, it takes a whole of government approach to execute. It's not just the Defense Department or the State Department, but it takes all of the elements of the U.S. government and the governments of our allies to prosecute this war. So now I want to talk about the, the areas that I think need to be integrated, and I'll start with the diplomatic actions. I think we should formally declare war on the Islamic State. The Islamic State is a little different than Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups in that they have proclaimed that they are a state. So we can hold them accountable, they hold territory, they're providing some social services besides all of the atrocities they commit, and they have a, a government of sorts, they've got an organization chart, and so in in almost all respects, it is a prototype state. And I think that we should formally declare war on it. Now, the problem is, uh, I hope you're all familiar with the guns and butter concept. And it's my opinion that guns and butter does not work. In fact, I think that's one of the mistakes that President Johnson made in, in the Vietnam War. I think it's a mistake <coughs> that we made in the Vietnam War. And I think it's a mistake that we made in the wars in Iraq. The problem is that if the American people don't understand that we're at war, that it's going to take sacrifices, they soon tire of the effort, and the, the, uh, the Congress usually capitulates, and we wind up starting these wars but not being able to win them uh, in the end. So, I think, in my opinion, that a formal declaration of war is a, a way to address this issue. It brings Congress into the act, uh, and I think that's essential. Uh, and it makes it very clear to the domestic audience and the foreign audience that the United States is serious about this and is going to pursue it as an all-out war in order to defeat the forces of the Islamic State. <clears throat> and it's, uh, I've concentrated so far tonight on, on uh, Iraq and Syria, but obviously uh, it applies to other areas as well as an example, Libya. And as you may have noted on that previous Wall Street Journal uh, graph, uh, there have been uh, numerous, what I would call, terrorist activities in, in Libya. The Libyan government is in, uh, in the shambles right now, and it becomes a very likely uh, state to, to go over to the Islamic State. I think we need to quit dancing around the issue. Leading from behind, in my opinion, does not work, and it only results in international chaos. The problem is that our allies, especially in the Arab world, if they see the United States, not the, the, the most powerful country in the world, if they see the United States not out in front and leading the effort, they see no reason that they should put their necks on the line and, uh, and help. Um, I think uh, there is an international coalition right now, and I think we have, and I don't think this president is actively leading that coalition. I think we should. We need to make it clear that the Muslims must help in solving the problem. Their countries, after all, are at risk. And in some of these countries, it, it probably is a physical, existential threat to those, to those countries. We need to put pressure on Saudi Arabia to stop support for radical elements and modernize their religious interpretation. We need to put extreme pressure on Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Pakistan, and Turkey to provide ground troops. I don't think we ought to use large numbers of U.S. troops on the ground. And that's not from the standpoint of trying to minimize U.S. casualties, but it's only it, it makes sense from the standpoint, if you have Muslim troops on the ground, 
it takes away one of the Islamic State uh, statements that it's uh, another crusade with the West uh, coming in to defeat Islam. Uh, and since the, these uh, Muslim countries are threatened, they should be the ones providing the bulk of the ground forces. And I think the reason that they haven't been willing to do that is they don't see the United States as serious and they don't see the United States taking a major lead uh, in the operations of the coalition. <laughs> I think we also uh, should support Kurdistan. They are some of the most effective fighters uh, in the area. And we need, you know, Iraq and Turkey are both opposed to providing uh, significant support to the Kurds. But I think we should tell uh, Turkey and Iraq that, uh, that it's for their benefit and we've got to bring the, the Kurds on board in a much more effective way. Now, last on the diplomatic list is that we've got to develop a plan with the coalition for governance of the areas recovered. And I would propose, this is my personal opinion, that we need to start thinking about revisiting the Sykes-Picot uh, boundaries that were set up after the end of the First World War. And we, we obviously can't do that uh, by ourselves, but we should work with the international community to revisit these boundaries. So, military actions. We're doing some of these things today, uh, but there's an awful lot of micromanagement going on, and we've got some rules of engagement that are absolutely ridiculous, in my opinion. Uh, so I've listed here all of the things that I think the U.S. should do. Provide intelligence to the coalition, including overhead imagery. Provide AWACS aircraft to support, uh, or for support, to provide a good tactical ground picture. Of course, the overhead imagery is largely strategic. Uh, there are some tactical aspects of it, but, but you can't station the satellites permanently over some areas and ignore others. So AWACS provides good support for the ground tactical picture. Provide drone support, and, but under the control of the local commanders. Do not micromanage. Today, much of the drone activity is controlled at the White House level, uh, which in my opinion is, is absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> we need to continue providing tactical air support from our carriers and Middle East land bases, but we need to increase the sortie rate to support ground operations. Now, one of the reasons they, they claim that the sortie rate is so low is that we don't have good target identification on the ground. But to solve that problem, we've got to put more of our people over there, especially for uh, targeting and as military advisors in the field. We've got to provide and operate regional command and control centers for the coalition with authority to conduct the war, again, without micromanagement from Washington. <coughs> we need to provide logistic support and financial resources for all of the the coalition forces as they need it. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, we need to get serious and change <coughs> the rules of engagement and expect some collateral damage. After all, if my prescription was followed, we would be at war. And let me give you an example. I understand that our aircraft were not allowed to strike oil tankers that were moving Islamic State oil out of the oil fields that they have control over because it was thought that the drivers might be civilian and they would claim civilian casualties. Absolutely, in my opinion, a mindless restriction. Uh, we need to provide the Kurds with effective weapons and supplies. Uh, and we're not doing that today directly, although I understand um, that there is there have been some better weapons provided 
through at our request to the uh, from the uh, from a NATO ally. Um, but of course, the problem here are the Turks and the Iraqis that don't particularly want us to support the Kurds. <coughs> but as I said earlier, we just have to tell Iraq and Turkey that this is what we're going to do, and it, it will help in ending this terrible scourge. <clears throat> we need to pressure NATO to participate. After all, the European Union right now is struggling with the migration problem, uh, which threatens a rupture. Uh, Europe not only has an economic problem, but they have this huge migration problem. And of course, one of the reasons is that the border between Syria and Turkey is open right now. Okay. Um, Next, economic actions. We need to attack the Islamic State control of oil infrastructure in a serious way. We need to stop oil smuggling through Turkey and elsewhere. And, you know, that, another good reason to close this border between Turkey and Syria. Stop foreign payments to the Islamic State. And, you know, the, there is some evidence, apparently, that Saudi Arabia is continuing to make some of the, not necessarily as a government, but Saudi Arabian people are providing financial support to the Islamic State. We need to identify their accounts and seize them. And lastly, but probably, very most importantly probably, as the coalition recovers areas, we've got to be willing to provide economic support for development and social services. It's going to be expensive, but it's absolutely necessary for stability, I bet. <clears throat> the public diplomacy actions, um, which is a largely forgotten part of the, the, one of the pillars of, that our strategy should contain. Right now, the U.S. public diplomacy is in a shambles. It's controlled by a board of governors. The, the chairman is a Hollywood executive. The CEO is a TV entertainment executive. And I'm sure they're great people. And they probably are very good at what they do in Hollywood and entertainment on TV. But in my opinion, and that of a lot of others, including my good friend Bob back there, um, they don't understand what's required for a strategic public diplomacy program. Uh, one of the techniques that they, these entertainers have uh, promoted is taking MTV videos and broadcasting that to the Muslim world. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, you know. I mean, that, I'll make you believe in torture. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, jumping down just to, to this, the U.S. secular culture, our strategic public diplomacy program needs to be inclusive, <coughs> and it needs to be representative of the description of our culture. It's not just the extremes on both coasts and the big cities. They've got to include the flyover country. What the, what the liberals tend to call a flyover country. And in my opinion, the extremes of our secular culture right now are great Islamic recruiting aids. MTVs don't help. Uh, but going back, there is a bill uh, in the House, H.R. 2323, titled U.S. International Communications Reform Act. It, it, effort is led by the chairman, Ed Royce, and, uh, and probably one of the most important of our public diplomacy actions has got to be to encourage Muslim reformation. In other words, a modern interpretation of Quran. I mentioned earlier that a radio station in Afghanistan is calling itself the voice of the caliphate. So, the Islamic State takes public diplomacy very seriously. And they, they do a very good job of it in terms of the message they want to get out to their followers. We don't have a comparable program. And then the last 
leg or pillar of our strategy should be in covert actions. And for obvious reasons, I don't want to get into a lot of details, uh, but there, there must be multiple opportunities in this area. We need to be very active with, and the whole advantage of covert <coughs> operations is, is that it provides us with plausible deniability that we're involved. Now just briefly, a couple of examples that I've thought about. And um, when, when you, we produce this video, we ought to edit this next, the next few statements out if we can do that. And now I want to switch to the domestic situation. Now, although not, not on the slide, it occurred to me uh, earlier in talking about uh, declaring war and the impact that it has on the domestic audience, uh, that's a big aspect of, of the domestic situation. If the people understand we're at war, then they are much more willing to make sacrifices and if they see the Congress and the administration all fully in the same direction, it changes the complexion of the problem in the United States. But what I want to talk about here are the, the uh, terrorist attacks. But whether we go to war uh, or not, terrorist attacks are going to be attempted against us and our allies in the name of Islamism. And this has amply been demonstrated by numerous events. To preempt these attacks, I think we've got to use what I call a pattern pattern based searches to identify a terrorist plan. We often do not have the identities of the perpetrators a priori. And the way our system works today, uh, if you're talking about uh, collecting information or uh, reporting telephone calls and so forth. Uh, the FISA Act and warrants require you to have the name of an individual for which you want to take this action, this surveillance action. But the problem is, as amply demonstrated, for example, most recently by the San Bernardino attack, is that we, we were unaware of the identities of these two people. So right now, uh, the intelligence community and the law enforcement community are not using pattern-based searches. They are people-specific. We're very good in forensic analysis after the fact, but the problem is to prevent San Bernardinos in the future, we've got to get much better to preempt them. And in my opinion, the way to do that is with what I call pattern-based searches. I worked on this issue uh, in the time I spent in DARPA after 9-11 in the Information Awareness Office. We were struggling with this very point because we predicted then that we were going to have lone wolf attacks and attacks by people that were anonymous to us a priori, and we had to figure out a way with technology to try to solve this problem. So we came up with what I call the privacy appliance concept. Uh, but there are there are some there are some problems with it from the the U.S. Uh, domestic standpoint, and those concern. Uh, with all of this data that's out there, we've got to figure out some way to gain the security information we need and at the same time protect the privacy of the individuals. Now, the government agencies in the national security domain work diligently in accordance with the law to protect the privacy of innocent individuals while protecting the U.S. from various threats. The people want this protection but they're concerned about privacy. And the problem is, the people don't trust the government. When, in the early days of the, uh, of the TIA program, I had a contract with the RAND Corporation uh, to think about uh, this whole business of how to achieve uh, security and maintain the privacy of people. 
And they did a, a short study and they compared the thinking about privacy and governments in Europe compared to the United States. And the interesting thing they found that in Europe, people trust the government, but they don't trust corporations. In the United States, it's just the reverse. People tend to trust the corporations by all of the, for instance, all of the personal information that's given out on Twitter and Facebook <laughs> and blogs. Uh, and people don't seem to be worried about the corporations having this information. But they are concerned about the government having, having it. So uh, we tried to figure out how, how we could use technology to help. And it's complicated, but I think it's possible. We came up with this concept. And the interesting thing, as, as uh, many of you probably know, Congress shut down the TIA program. We started it in January of 2002. And Congress shut it down in late 2003. So we were operational for about, about two years. Uh, but the interesting thing is that although the, the office that I had initiated in DARPA was closed, but the money on, and all of the programs, and we were operating it as an unclassified program. And one of the reasons, by the way, that we wanted to make it unclassified was that we knew we didn't have all the answers and we wanted to take advantage of the universities and a, a broad spectrum of uh, commercial companies. And the trouble is when you make a program classified, especially a highly classified program, you limit the amount of input that you can get from the universities. And so in, in um, we made a decision very early on that we would make the program unclassified. Um, and we were not secretive about what we were trying to do. We issued a broad agency announcement in early January of uh, 2002, and we were very open in that BAA on what kind of technology we were interested in. Just as a sidebar, uh, this, we talked about the need of having a, a uh, address the problem of how to achieve security with privacy as one section of the BAA. We got almost zero responses from the universities and the commercial companies. People just hadn't thought about the problem. Um, eventually, we uh, prompted uh, uh, what used to be called Xerox Park. Um, we prompted them, and they came in with a, a reasonable proposal. But anyway, when it came time to, for Congress to close down, they moved all of my programs out of the unclassified budget and they moved it into the classified section of the DOD budget, which supports the intelligence community. And the leadership was turned over to what was called at the time ARDA, and it eventually became IARPA, the Intelligence Agency's Research and, and, and Development Organization. Um, but the only thing that wasn't transferred was work on the privacy appliance concept. And one of the reasons is that we had resistance from the intelligence community about the concept because they thought that it would slow down uh, their analytical efforts too much. And you know, as I said, you know, the, the people in these agencies like NSA and, and so on, and the FBI, uh, they all think that they're doing things in accordance with the law and they're trying to protect the privacy of innocent people and find the information they need for security. And so why should they be bothered with something like called the Privacy Protection Appliance? But in my opinion, what they forget is that the American people don't trust them. And it's a sad state of affairs, uh, but that's the way it is. And one of the purposes of this appliance would be to 
as best we can do with technology is to restore that confidence. So, how does this thing work? Uh, the idea is that you've got databases out there around the world that are relevant to the problems that you're trying to solve. And atop each of those databases, you put this thing called a privacy appliance. It sits on top of it. So you've got transactions that are taking place around the world, and, and by transactions, a, a, an email message would be a transaction. Uh, a credit card purchase would be a transaction. An airplane flight would be a transaction, and so on and so on. So you have a collaborative multi-agency analytical environment over here, and, and since 2002, uh, the intelligence community and law enforcement community have, have pretty well been able to establish this kind of multi-agency analytical environment. So the idea is that from this environment, pattern-based queries, and I'll explain those a bit more in a minute, uh, they go into the cloud of databases out here, and they go to the privacy appliance. And we're going to talk about how it works in a minute. And then out comes the filtered results, their answers to this query, into automated data repositories. But one of the key points here is that you don't pull all of this data into government databases. I mean, obviously, some of those databases are government, some of them are commercial, um, and, um, and, and largely what's happened with the changes recently within the past year uh, to NSA's collection is that they've actually moved in this direction. In other words, the <coughs> telephone companies are keep, going to keep the records, and then the queries are made to the telephone companies, and, and then the results are returned. But, Unless this process is highly automated, the time late in that process is going to be very significant. So, um, the patterns are, are very important uh, in that the pattern is the information that you're looking for in the context of terrorist activity. If you don't include a lot of context here in the pattern-based queries, you run into this problem, these, what's called the six degrees of separation, where every single person is connected through six degrees to every other person. Uh, but that's only true if you forget the context. <clears throat> now, so how do you get these patterns? Well, my solution was that you have red teams and they are simulating threat organizations that plan attacks and develop the pattern of transactions that they would have to conduct in order to carry out the attack planning. Now, and just to give you an example, I, the, from, from a research and development standpoint, I set up one red team and it was headed by a former director of DARPA. There was about a dozen people, a very eclectic group. There was a lawyer, there was a, a special forces <coughs> retired guy. And the special forces is probably the closest thing that we have to terrorists. Um, <laughs> and uh, there was a, a banker and just a, a very eclectic group covering a, a large area a large domain of the kinds of activities that a terrorist would have to take in order to plan and carry out an attack. So, uh, let's see, next. So, uh, how does this privacy appliance work? Uh, and I call it an appliance because I, I wanted to, to separate it from uh, a computer or a piece of software, and I wanted you to think about it in terms of something that you could get your, your hands around and, uh, and was well defined. And so that's the reason for this dotted line around it. 
and that's a transparent, cryptographically protected shell. And it's transparent because we want everybody to understand exactly how it works. It's cryptographically protected so that it can't be modified by insiders or outsiders. But, and we publish the source code for the appliance. Some of you may remember what, what's called the clipper chip problem, which was a, uh, a solid state uh, device that NSA developed uh, a few decades ago for encryption. And the problem was they had a back door uh, into the encryption algorithm so that NSA could break the encryption easily. Uh, and uh, so it was, uh, there was a lot of discussion about it. I think there were some lawsuits involved. Uh, but anyway, uh, whenever we talk about something like this, we need to avoid uh, the clipper chip problem. And my way of doing that is to publish the source code for it and, and have this transparent shell around how it actually works. So there are several components here. The policy and business rules and regulations are, are embedded in it, but they've got to be in machine-readable form. This is a huge problem because, frankly, and we probably have some lawyers in the room, but I hope you won't take offense. And I say that lawyers like to write laws and regulations in ways that can be interpreted. And it's very hard uh, to convert that into something that's uh, black, and wh black or white and machine readable. Uh, but it, it needs to be done. Uh, authorization tables about who is authorized to make what kind of queries. The associative memory processing is, a, is an index into all those worldwide distributed databases that are out there. Then there's an inference control, knowledge base, and selective revelation I'll talk more about in a minute, and an immutable audit trail, and masking. Now, we've talked a little bit about the search patterns, about how you come up with them. But in this concept, the, just as you get a FISA request or a, a warrant, law enforcement community to conduct uh, surveillance, uh, you get a, a judicial authority uh, to authorize these search patterns. So you, you, know, you take the search patterns the red teams come up with, and then you go to something like the FISA court and say, okay, we want to make searches on this pattern to see how many instances there are out there of this particular pattern. Now, initially, so the, the, the judicial authority authorizes the, uh, the search pattern, and at the same time, they also authorize what kind of detail can you get back uh, from that query. Initially, the concept is that the, the only thing you can get back at first would be the number of instances of this search, of this pattern that's out there. And for example, if you went out with a pattern and you got 100,000 hits, then what that would tell you is that the pattern is not discriminating enough. Because in the whole scheme of things, terrorist activity is relatively rare in terms of all of the actions that take place in the world. So you go back and you refine the pattern to make it more discriminating, and you get approval you go back out again, and let's say this time you get 100 hits. Well, you know, that's a reasonable number. So then you go to the judicial authority and get authorization, let's say, to find out the details at some level. Maybe the names are still anonymized, but you find out what countries the people are from, how many people are involved, uh, and so on and so on. But anyway, I hope you get the idea that you go through this process, and at each, at each level of authorization, you would get more and more details until you finally get down to being able to say, okay, we want to go after this person and this person, and then the system that we've got in place now for doing uh, identity uh, searches uh, would, would take over. Now, the, uh, 
one of the problems with this, and the reason it's complicated, is that the way I've described it, it sounds like it'd be a very long process. And so the, the system has to work in a highly automated way. I mean, right now, a FISA request, as I understand it, takes a stack of paper that's about like this for every FISA request. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you know, that, that's, and especially with the restrictions that NSA is under now, that's intolerable in terms of making it so time late uh, in order to, uh, to find the, the information that you're looking for. So it has to be a highly automated uh, system. Uh, inference control has to do with the fact that um, you have to be careful in, if you have access to multiple databases and you get a little bit of information here and a little bit here and a little bit here, if you put all that together, even though the name may be anonymized, you can come down pretty close to identifying who the person is. So that can be handled with a, a knowledge base that talks about you know what kind of data is in each of the databases and so forth. Um, access control, I think we really pretty much talked about that. Okay, the immutable <coughs> control. In my opinion, the only way that you can deter abuse of the system and satisfy the public's concern about not trusting the government is that you have to be able to punish the offenders. And it needs to be an ongoing effort, uh, not simply uh, something um, after the fact, uh, some uh, situation occurs and, and it was unknown that somebody was doing such and so. So our solution to that was that an immutable audit trail, and by immutable I mean that it can't be modified by the insiders or the outsiders, and the Congressional Oversight Committees have access to the immutable audit trail. And they use the same tools that are used for analysis to find the bad guys, to look at the, the audit trail and find uh, people that are abusing the system, and then they need to be punished. Uh, and I would argue there are very few of these, but the point is that to make the people trust the system, you've got to provide for this kind of audit trail and accountability. Uh, there needs to be a, what I call, a masking function. Uh, because obviously, with, that, with worldwide distributed databases out there, uh, unclassified, some owned by corporations, maybe some owned by foreign governments, uh, you need to figure out a way of masking the query in such a way that it's not obvious what the analysts are looking for. Uh, and I, I mentioned the associated memory index. So, um, <coughs> that's it. <laughs> Entertain a few questions. Yeah, what tool uh, do you suggest for this, like a pilot gear of a sort of uh, type of tool that would meet all of the uh, criteria? No, uh, I'm not a fan of pilot uh, Neither are we. Yeah, it, well, anybody that's used it is not a fan. It's just they've got very good advertising. It's a very slick product, but it's very manual. Um, and this has to be a purpose built, uh, again, I'm not going to call it a device, but an appliance. Um, and, you know, it's not going to be easy to develop, but right now we're not working on it. Yes, sir. I know one, Dexter. Would you recommend to help the Kurds, uh, allowing them to, to get their independence as a, a republic? Well, that was what I was hinting at and saying that, um, that I think in the long term we need to revisit sykes Picot, uh, And I would personally be in favor of, of, uh, of giving the Kurds their independence, which is, would be an anathema to Turkey. 
Yes, sir. And that from Turkey to Syria to right. Iran to just about everybody. Everybody, everybody agrees on one thing. They all hate the Kurds. Yeah. But you can't, it can't have been a mistake that you completely avoided mentioning Iran in your entire presentation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one level, I can make a strong case to say ISIS is irrelevant. Their body count compared to what Al Qaeda and Iran have done is trivial. Mm -hmm. Um, Chief Shah. So are you suggesting that we don't war with Iran? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely not. No. But a solution or a proposal that doesn't address the fact that there are already people playing on the ground there. Uh, There's already a complicated playing field. And to say that, well, gee, ISIS is bad, we need to take them out. Who's going to fill the place? We already found out what happened to the Sunni domination in, uh, in Iraq. It's now an Iranian client city. Syria is going to be an Iranian yeah, alliance. That's a weak point in the, in the lecture, I admit. Yes, sir. Since he's opened the issue of Iran, uh, and since you're a Navy man, what can you tell us about the capture of the boats? Uh, um, I think it's a very peculiar story, and I don't think we've heard all of the details. I cannot imagine how in that environment, they could be 50 miles off course. Um, so there's a lot we don't understand. I have an alliance that suggested that they may have been able to jam the GPS. I, uh, I read that. Ace is a good friend. And uh, he may be right, but I don't, I don't think there's any evidence of that yet. So I think we ought to uh, keep our powder dry for a little bit. And I mean, the, the interesting thing will be is if the officer in charge is not court martial. If he's court-martialed, then a lot of information will come out. If he's not court-martialed, then it was some kind of contrived incident, in my opinion. Yes, sir. What you're saying about the revising the site pin shape in theory? Powder. That's what I was Islamic State has been saying that for a while. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Islamic State has said that the reason why the Middle East and Muslims are down is that they're divided by countries. They want to unify those countries into one nation. This is something that is, it's not just Islamic State has said this, but Al-Qaeda and even the Arab nationals and the Abu Nasar said the same thing. And one thing of the problem in the Middle East is that you have a lot of people, like in Saudi Arabia, that are from, that were, are Egyptian citizens, uh, cold, uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen citizens, and I've dealt with people that were from, who were born and grew up in Saudi Arabia, but they can't get citizenship. Those people are prime recruits for Islamic State because they realize that their lives are they're always going to be second class citizens in the country where they've lived all their lives because their parents weren't there before 1920. Right. And that's one of the reasons why Islamic State is doing such a great job with recruiting is that there's a lot of disparities in those countries. And people say, you know, people say, I was talking to a guy from the house who grew up in the Saudi Arabia. He's from Yemen, he's, he's of Yemen descent. He says, the Saudis are racist. He says, the Saudis are racist because I can never become a citizen there. Yeah. I'll always be a second class citizen. And you wonder why Islamic State is growing. Well, there certainly needs to be a lot of work done. And I, I covered in one of the points the whole business of governing these areas needs to be addressed. And uh, hopefully, if we had strong US leadership, uh, we might make some progress. Because these, these, company, these countries are like Saudi Arabia. I mean, the monarchy there is threatened unless they get their act squared away. Yes, sir. Uh, I I simply want to express my appreciation for the freedom-loving American that you care enough about my freedom and privacy to undertake what, what you've done. I applaud that. Here, here. Thank you. I, I had a question about the TIA. You mentioned that it went from being um, unclassified to classified, so it was handed over, presumably, to the NSA and other intelligence agencies. I had a two-part question. So what do you think they've done with it? Um, and have they transformed your system and have, and, and have they applied it? Secondly, 
Um, to what extent, I know that there was a symbol for TIAs that showed sort of this all-seeing eye across the whole globe. So how, to what extent is it targeted and to what extent is it vacuuming in everything and, and related to our hegemonic status in the world? Okay, well, first of all, uh, the simple part of your answer is the, the eye, the all-seeing eye. You know, that's the great seal of the United States. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, after the criticism of... Well, your secret thing was from knowledge, power. Yeah. Well, and so we... Yeah, internally, we changed the logo. We put a blindfold over the eyes. <laughs> We made the, the world, the earth, a smiley, the yellow smiley face, <laughs> and cha changed the from the Latin. The Latin. The, we put. We made ex ignorantia beatitudes. Ignorance is blessed. <laughs> uh, When Congress closed down TIA, as I said, they moved all the programs into the intelligence community, and the funding was placed into the classified DOD budget. And with the exception of the privacy of clients, work continued on all of the, TIA was a bunch, it was an umbrella over a lot of different programs. And all the programs that were in that umbrella, except for the privacy appliance, weren't continued on them. You know, and so from my point of view, TIA was a great success, except for the privacy appliance, in that we got the intelligence community to think differently about the whole process of analysis, a much more systematic approach to analysis. Um, I'll tell you a sea story in a minute, but Anyway, um, and that's what we really one of DARPA's roles. You know, DARPA is not an operational agency. They're research and development. They are designed, going back to the Eisenhower administration when it was first formed, uh, with creating new ideas, starting research, and then turning it over to the appropriate other agency of the government. And that's essentially what happened with the exception of the, of the privacy appliance. Now, the, uh, the anecdote was that I was involved, a, a predecessor of TIA was another program called Channel. And uh, when I, I had a, 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 a private business, and in 95, I closed that down and started working as a, a CETA, an advisor to DARPA. And the first program was called Genoa. And Genoa transitioned to be part of TIA, but it, it wasn't nearly as broad and as all encompassing. Um, and we had demonstrations. We had a lab, and we had demonstrations. And one day, uh, and I'll keep him anonymous, but he was the chairman of the National Intelligence Council, and which he had been for several years. And um, so he came in uh, to the demonstration and sat there and <clears throat> watched. And um, in the end, and General was all about, as Tia was, all about taking a more systematic approach to analysis. And so when he, when we finished, he said to me, John, he says, well, that's all very nice, but we don't have time to do all the systematic analysis. <laughs> to me, the only thing that's important is on the day after, who knew what when? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a very, very discouraging response. Now, granted, this man had been in office for several years. He was tired. He was worn out. But, unfortunately, we had that problem I don't think we have as much today, and I, whether rightfully or wrongfully, I attribute a lot of that to the work that we did in TIA to get the intelligence community and law enforcement 
think about more systematic approaches. Does that answer your question? I'll follow up with you later. Okay. Anything How else? How much dog's name is? Uh, we have a dog named Chow. Yes, bud. Don, thank you for all you've been doing for the past 25 years and developing the the algorithms, the methodology. It seems to me that your work really has laid a foundation that is coming into its own, or certainly could, if if you were able to continue nurturing it with the resources and uh, big data capabilities that are required. I think what you've done and what you could oversee is just essential. And I think here and there people are demonstrating some applications that are derivative, I think, of your work. I was in Israel about a year ago, and about a half a dozen expats from Mossad had begun to look at all of the open source databases that are available from everything, and apparently innocent as air traffic control and border crossings and all of these things in a historical context and in short to use both human for example to see all of the graduates of terrorist training schools that they find by human and crack them in and then track those people for the rest of their lives and associate them as your system allows with who do they associate with? Who do they talk to? And ultimately, they believe, achieve a predictive capability. Well, that's what I want. I mean, as you know, intelligence is one thing to know capabilities, it's another to know intentions. And intentions are tough. For sure. Uh, John, if I could just point out to those of you who may not have seen the questioner, we particularly want to welcome tonight another national security advisor to President Reagan, who, along with Admiral Poindexter, uh, was uh, uh, contributing a contributor toward the United States' victory in the Cold War. And that's Bud McFarland. <laughs> Actually, if you want to give kudos, give them to Bob Riley. Yeah. If you haven't read Bob's book, The Closing of Muslim Mind, I highly recommend it. I asked John to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good dinner, though. Thank you. <laughs> well worth it. You mentioned Declaration of War. What do you think is the likelihood of a Declaration of War? or letters of bark and reprisal actually coming out of the United States Congress? I would prefer the war. Um, I think it's cleaner and um, the other smacks a little bit of mercenary forces. Um, Americans have a little bit of a repulsion. Although it's certainly not uncommon in our history. But the war is the way to go, and, I, and I, I'm convinced that, that our problems in, uh, in um, uh, Vietnam, Iraq, uh, the country not going to war, and the people not recognizing that it is a significant threat to the United States. And it also, it brings Congress into the act. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are the chances Congress will do that? Um, unless there's a... It depends on the member. It depends on the member. <laughs> yeah. 
And I don't know what the candidate, I don't think any candidates are uh, thinking in those terms. Yes, sir. Yeah, Boko Haram, sir. Okay. The connection between ISIS and Boko Haram, is there any? Yes. Or yeah. if yes, there sir. isn't any? Yeah. And the second question is the president of Chad, uh, Idris Deby, he's been uh, nominated the president, the chairman of the African Union. And uh, he was, or he is, uh, one of the major allies in the fight against Boko Haram. Do you think that his new function as the president of the African Union will prevent him from doing anything? Well, I didn't mean to exclude Africa from the countries that need to provide troops. I think, you know, the, the countries in Africa that are, that are fighting the problem today and are willing to continue fighting ought to be included in the coalition. What about Boko Haram? They, yeah, they, they are. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, uh, in that Islamic State five-year plan, I forget what they call that province, but it's on their list. Yes. Yes, sir, I want to compliment you on an outstanding presentation. One comment that relates to what this gentleman brought up about Iran, and that's the role of Russia in all of this. They're there. Right. We have to deal with that. Yeah. And if you were going to add anything to it in addition to Iran, I would add Russia because Russia is part of the triangle with Iran and Islam. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I, I mainly wanted to focus on Muslim. No, I, am, I understand. Uh, but we, again, uh, I think, um, in my opinion, Putin does not hold President Obama in high regard. I know. He doesn't pay really, <laughs> really attention to it. You don't want to hear what he calls it. Say mildly. But quite seriously, they've changed the whole on-ground reality yes. where they're operating. Yeah, and we obviously, you know, we, we shouldn't draw red lines in the sand so you're going to ignore them. But I've about talked out people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming tonight. So grateful to Admiral Poindexter for coming this evening. If you come back, I promise we'll have more chairs. <laughs> so please go to the Westminster site, and we'll soon have our announcements of upcoming lectures, and of course we'll uh, send you emails. Thank you so much for coming.